You're viewing a message from the pulpit of Rolling Hills Church, located in Verona, Pennsylvania. We're glad that you could join us as we open up the Word of God. Straight line. 
Because if you look backwards, what ends up happening is you start to go off. And Jesus said that we, as his disciples, are to walk a straight and narrow path. That if we start looking back at all of the things that may have happened in our lives, if we start looking back at ways that maybe we have been hurt in the past or anything else, when we start doing that, we lose sight of our goal. And it becomes very easy for us to kind of fall off the straight and narrow path. So as Christians, as disciples, are you about to sneeze? You have that look on your face even if you're about to sneeze. I do that too. I know that look. So as disciples of Jesus Christ, we stay on that narrow path and we keep our eyes focused on Him alone. So no matter what happens in life, the things that try to distract us, we pay no attention to those things. We focus on Jesus Christ alone and He helps us to walk that straight and narrow path. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, each and every person that's uh, in this church, that's up here, each child that's, that's up here. God, we pray that you would help all of us to stay on that straight and narrow path. That as things start to happen in life and, and we start to look around and take our eyes off of you, Lord, that you would help us to bring our focus and our attention back to you. God, allow us to serve you and to follow you and to know that we are walking in your ways. Help us to be obedient and courageous and no matter what is happening in our lives, to keep our eyes solely on you, Jesus Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can head off to Kids Church. Here's Pastor Greg with part five of his Disciple Shift series titled Shifting Together. God, we do pray that as we come into this time that you would uh, speak to us and allow us to know that uh, we are hearing from you. Help us to be obedient to the things that you would call us to. Thank you for already being here and allowing us to celebrate you through song, through a handshake and a hug with someone, uh, with welcoming new members into the church. God, it's for your glory that we do all of this, and it's for uh, your presence in our lives as to why we are here. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak here now and bring us ever closer to you. To your name we pray. Amen. So how many of you know how to drive a stick shift? I'm curious. Okay. It's, a, uh, it, it's kind of becoming a lost art, it seems. Um, I do not know how to drive a stick shift, not because I'm afraid of it or anything like that, but by the time I started driving, uh, my parents were you know, well into their early 50s, and then, you know, most people at that point are not looking, most parents at that point are not looking to get their child of 16 a fun little sports car or something like that in which I would have to learn how to drive a stick shift. So I've only ever driven automatics. Um, I've spent about five minutes behind the wheel of a, uh, of a standard. So needless to say, that was not enough time for me to, to begin to learn how to drive a, uh, a stick shift. But, even if we do not know how to drive one, we still understand what it means to shift something. Uh, if you have to shift your weight, it's really not a big deal. You go from this to this, you know, kind of thing. It's not like this, this big uh, undertaking that has to go on. If you are shifting lanes while driving, you go from this lane over to this lane. Again, it's not a big deal unless there happens to be another car in the lane, which means you do not shift up. When shifting gears on a vehicle or on a bike, uh, they are really just small changes that happen either within the engine or on the gear shaft, uh, but they are significant in helping us do that which we would hope to do. So this week you know, we have our last message uh, on this series called Disciple Shift. And when I talk about Disciple Shift, that allows us to do that which we are supposed to do easier. Uh, it's really small changes that allow us um, 
to be more obedient to that which God has called the church to do. Uh, why do you shift your weight? It's because you are standing in one way and whatever it is that you're doing, maybe it will be easier if you shift your weight. Why do you shift gears, either in a bicycle or in a vehicle? It's to make things easier, to, so you can go faster and easier, or so you can pedal easier. Why are we shifting the way we do discipleship? To make it easier. But it also allows us to disciple people the way that we are supposed to disciple them. So when we shift something, we're not changing what we are doing. Uh, or, I'm sorry, we are changing what we are doing, but we are, we are not adding something to it. When we shift from one lane to another, we've changed positions. We did not add something to what to, to drive it. So as we look at shifting the way discipleship happens here at Rolling Hills, I hope that you can see this as a change in, in what we do, not as something that we have to add into our lives. I say this because if you are not growing in your relationship with God right now, the last thing you need is for somebody to come along and add something to what already is not working. Instead, you change what you are doing because what you were doing is not helping you get there. So you make a slight change and now hopefully you have a clearer path to discipleship. We do not have to add anything to our lives. You see, the church is expected to grow. Um, even though a lot of people in our culture believe that the church in the United States has plateaued, I would like to be able to, to serve as a, as a, as a way to, to argue against that mentality, uh, to show people that, that the church is indeed vibrant, that the church is growing by simply returning to the things that we were supposed to do and making discipleship easier by shifting it. But in order to do that, in order for the church to grow in, in number, in depth of, of spiritual relationship, uh, to grow in, in the number of relationships we have with one another, uh, each and every one of us needs to be committed to discipling, to discipling someone else or to being a disciple. And so I know in speaking with a few people here, they, I, I've been... Uh, I've been encountering these two different questions from them. The first question is, should I really be in this discipling relationship with someone? And how do I do it? What does discipling look like? Uh, so let's deal with the first question first. Should I be in a discipling relationship with someone? Yes. Okay, next question. Uh, actually, we can spend a little more time dealing with that because in order for us to understand uh, why we should be involved in this relationship with someone else that is being discipled or that is discipling us, we first need to understand where we are spiritually before we can begin to understand how we should go about beginning this relationship with someone. So we have to ask ourselves a question. What makes someone an adult? Is it experience? Is it age? Uh, is it attitude, their behaviors? What can we say when we look at someone and we can say, okay, there is an adult. Um, do you know someone that should be an adult? You know, they, they have the experience. In, order, in other words, they're old enough to be an adult, but they still act like a child. And I'm not talking about the cute ways here where, like, you know, you have the, the old guy with the earring or the, the older lady that, like, jumps off the skateboard or that sort of thing. I'm referring to that older person that should know better, but has not grown up. They are still irresponsible. They are still uncontrollable with their behaviors. Uh, you just want to grow or to go to them, grab them, and say, "Will you just grow up?" Or maybe you know someone that is the exact opposite. You know that child that is 13 going on 35, at least in their mind. Uh, they are stressing about things even though they were only five years old. And you want to say to them, slow down, enjoy the process of growing up. You do not have to do it right now. Uh, enjoy being a child for now. There were certainly times where I wanted to be more like an adult uh, as when I was a teenager or a child uh, because I thought that there were certain benefits uh, that, that I would be able to gain as being an adult. 
But really, I never felt like an adult until I had children of my own. And I don't know if that was anyone else's experience, but until I became a father was when it finally sunk into me that, okay, I actually need to start acting like an adult now. But what makes somebody spiritually mature, uh, a spiritual adult or a spiritual parent, is it the amount of time that is spent in a church? Well, we know that by spending a, an amount of time getting older, that does not necessarily make you an adult. So the same thing would be true here. Just because you're in church for a very long time does not mean that you are a spiritual adult or a spiritually mature. We all know people from within the church, whether it is this church or some church from our past, uh, where they we, we wonder, did you ever really get it? All of the sermons, all of the Bible studies, all the things you read, did it ever really sink into you? Because that's great that you've been in a church for 35 years, but I know you are still a raging gossiper. And you have shown that by your behavior, you still have not grown from being a spiritual child. Or I see the way you treat other people and the way you try to force your agenda on the life of the church. And it makes me realize you're really not very spiritually mature yet, even though you've been here uh, for 20, 30, 40 years. Then we can think of other people uh, that maybe have been in the faith for just a few months and, and um, they think that they should become a pastor. Or, you know, I, I've encountered these people where they just came to faith in Jesus Christ and like three weeks later they're coming up to me and saying, so how do I become a pastor? And I'm like, all right, slow down, Skippy. <laughs> it takes time. Um, you need to, to grow and to know that this is who God is growing you into first. Not saying you're not going to be a pastor, but enjoy your time as a, as a spiritual child. Uh, so where are you? If there is a way that we could look at some kind of guide to figure out, okay, this is where I fall in this, this, uh, this, this process of going from first being a Christian to being a spiritually mature adult parent, uh, where would I fall on that spectrum? Rather than assuming that time equals maturity, because we know that is not the case, how about we begin looking at things like behaviors and actions and words as growth marks for a Christian, and more importantly, a disciple. And one last thing about these stages that I'm going to talk about, I just Uh, one other thing about this is that when we look at these different stages, we have to realize that it is possible, it is very possible to become stagnated in one stage. So you can be on fire and you come to Christ and now you're this child and you've never grown up or you reach some other stage. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of determination to move from one stage into the next as we grow in our spiritual uh, lives. And one other thing to remember here is that Jesus did not call us to go out and make spiritually mature people. He called us to go and make disciples. So the point is not becoming spiritually mature. The point is becoming a disciple so that you then can go out and make more disciples. So this first stage is kind of confusing. Uh, it would be somebody that is spiritually dead. But I do not connect with any one particular religion. And this is someone that is just not there yet. Uh, they need to move from this place, from these thoughts and these statements, into a place in which they can begin to, to grow in Jesus Christ. And once they hear that call upon their lives, and they begin to look to God uh, for that relationship, they know that they have been saved by Him, that their sins have been forgiven, and that this is more than just some kind of emotional response at a concert. A person or a disciple would then move into this next stage of life, which would be the infant stage. Boa constrictor. And one of my cousins thought it would be really funny to go outside in the summertime. We had a huge oak tree. I mean, I don't know how big it was to a four-year-old. It was, you 
you know, the biggest thing that's ever grown. Huge oak tree, and he thought it would be really cool to see how far into the tree he could throw my stuffed bow. Um, so he did. And my, he, my cousin, he was like maybe nine or ten years old or something like that. So he throws the snake up into the tree. And I can remember looking at it and thinking, oh, there's no way I'm going to get anyone to get that thing. So I go and ask my dad. My dad's afraid of heights. He, uh, he was one of these people, he was never afraid of heights was when he was in the Marines, but at some point he was showing one of my older brothers how to climb a tree. And he got like halfway up the tree and he's like, I can't go any further and I cannot get down. He just froze. And so from ever since then, uh, he had been afraid of heights. So I remember seeing this stuffed animal um, snake up in the tree. And when we moved, and this snake was still up there. And I could see it. You know, every parent knows what's like, oh, we've got to get him to the bathroom kind of look. And he has this look, and he just looks at Nicole and just starts slapping her. He was, because he, in his mind, he thought she was making him sick. So he's like getting angry at her. Why are you holding me and making me sick? He didn't know any better. And unfortunately, me as the, like, witnessing this, I could not help but laugh about it. He was fine. Well, obviously, he's here today and everything else. Um, but it was this weird thing of just this infant that did not know any better. And so he wasn't trying to be mean or nasty or anything like that. We understood, okay, it takes a few years to, to kind of develop the finer skills of, of being sick. And we all know that as parents. But spiritual infants, they do things and they say things out of ignorance. They do not know any better. They say things like, really, I need to go to church on a regular basis? I've never heard that before. I do not need anyone else. It is just me and Jesus Christ, is what a spiritual infant would say. Uh, I need to pray and read the Bible on a regular basis? How come no one ever told me that before? Tithing? What in the world is tithing? I need someone to regularly care for me. Or why did my wife and, and I, we, we just got into a fight after we left worship. What is the deal? I thought that when I would accept Jesus Christ into my life, that he would make everything better. And now here's my wife and I getting into this argument after just leaving church. They are curious and they are genuine, but they have not had enough experience in growing in Jesus Christ. And so they say things out of ignorance. Eventually, though, children, or I'm sorry, infants grow into children, much to the, the uh, dismay of the number of parents. And so, as a child, you start to think about things differently. Now, this is old school Star Wars. This is like real Star Wars toys, not these little rinky dink things they have out now. This is the Millennium Falcon. It made the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs, in case you were wondering. <laughs> and the Millennium Falcon, this, like, this isn't the exact, like, my literal toy that I had growing up. It was like this, but mine is long gone. And so one day we went to this uh, Star Wars fair thing, and I saw one of these. And they, well, they just don't make toys like this anymore, kind of thing. So. I had to buy this for Eli. And I haven't played with it since then. But, you know, there were, there have been a couple times where I certainly brought the, uh, the handle down there so I can you know, fly it around with it and everything else. But probably not. I had, you know, the nice thing with being uh, a, an oops baby is that all of my siblings were, were grown and out of the house. So that means I was the one that got to be spoiled. By my parents. So I had tons and tons of Star Wars toys. And when my friends would come over to the house to play Star Wars, uh, they could play with anything except this. Like they knew that, okay, I, I could play with the Death Star, I could play with the, uh, the Slave One, I could play with the Tauntaun. All of you are like, what? Unless you're my age. Um, but do not touch my Millennium Falcon. And why was I like that? Because children are naturally selfish, aren't they? They can certainly show signs of grace and unselfishness. I'm not saying they never do that, but, sorry, 
He's up there. Out in the uh, aisle there. <laughs> but with any child, there, there comes this time where they are just naturally selfish. They do not like to share. They say things like a spiritual child would say things like, you know, I don't know if this church is really meeting my needs right now. Maybe I should go look for another church. Or who are these new people that have come into the church and why are they sitting in my seats? Don't they know any better? Uh, I didn't really care for the music today. Why was that person wearing that particular outfit today? I just don't get it. We should play more contemporary songs. We should sing more hymns. Why in the world does the pastor play drums? Uh, no one ever says hello to me at church. You know, in fact, the other, last week I was standing in the church and, or in the lobby and somebody walked by and they didn't even say hello to me. I wasn't fed by that sermon at all today. Well, I would like to join this ministry, but no, no one's asked. And so how can I join it? And I was helping in a ministry, but they did not appreciate what I was doing, so I quit. And please understand that I am not sharing these things as a way to, to belittle it or anything like that. It's to show you that I know that that is the thought pattern of many people. Because when you are in that stage, you are a spiritual child. And it's not, again, it's not to belittle you. It's just that's where you are. You know, I don't fault my children for being children. That's, that's who they are. But I also stand alongside them and help them grow. So it's one thing when a child says something. It's different if you're talking with a 40-year-old person and they're talking about having to rush home so that they can play with their toys. And it's the same thing that's true in the church. You can give room and you can give grace to people that say spiritually childish things when they are just a Christian. But if you've been in the church for 30, 40 years, 20 years, it's time to grow up. And you grow up by becoming a disciple and being discipled by someone else, by beginning to seek someone out that is more spiritually mature than you are and, and begin that relationship with them where they can begin to invest their lives into you to help you grow, to stand alongside of you and say, you know what, I understand why you're saying that, but let's look at what we can read about that in the Bible and see if that changes our perspective on things. And I hope that this is going to be something that becomes a regular occurrence here at Rolling Hills, that people would look all the time, who's somebody that can disciple me? Or you reach that point, you've grown through these different stages, and now you're at a stage where you can say, who's someone that I can begin to disciple? The fourth stage, so we have death, we have infancy, we have spiritual child, fourth stage is a spiritual young adult. Uh, this is a person that is beginning to shift from self-centeredness and selfishness to God-centeredness and, and other-centeredness. Uh, this person begins to ask him or herself, what are, how can I become a part of the life of the church? Rather than simply coming and taking and sitting, what can I actually do to be involved now? A spiritual young adult is seeking or is seeing that because of his or her relationship with Jesus Christ, they now realize that I need to give to other people. They see life outside of themselves and they see things in their own lives as hindrances or excuses for not going, for growing. They begin to look critically at their lives and say, okay, this is what's keeping me from growing in my relationship with Jesus Christ. I need to get rid of it. I need to stop devoting so much time to it. It's getting me nowhere spiritually. And so they are no longer too busy to be a part of a small group. They are no longer too busy to have this discipling relationship with someone. Instead, they look hard at their lives and they see the things that they can cut out of it because they realize they need to live for more than themselves. My young adult life was defined by two things. Nicole and music and drums, and it would not be appropriate for me to use Nicole as a sermon prop. So instead, I have my drumsticks out again. And 
what had happened, and I was, thought, I was thinking about maybe I should just like throw all my grunge clothes on and make it smell like the 90s in here kind of thing, and I was really close to doing that until I tried them on. I still have them in my closet just in case my children grow up and they're like, yeah, I'm going to dress like Kurt Cobain. And they can, but I cannot anymore because um, that was a long time ago. But what happened in my young adult life is I stopped looking at drums as something that would just benefit me. It was something that was fun for me to do. It was something that would make me famous. It was something that would make me rich. Uh, it impressed different people. And so what I started to do is I began to allow drums to become more about me. And I started to see how by doing something that I really enjoy, I could actually be a blessing to other people. I could be a part of a worship team, a worship band, and, and go and play this music and, uh, and allow that to grow their lives to become more Christ-like. Uh, it was something that allowed me uh, to have an impact on other people. I was able to step outside of who I was and allow my passions to begin to help other people to grow. A spiritual young adult says things like, you know, in my devotions I came across something and I have a question about it. Or somebody else asked me this question and I really didn't know the answer. So help me to figure this out. Or they say things like, look at how many people are in worship today. This is incredible. I had to park at the end of the parking lot in order to find a parking spot. Praise God for that. I have a friend that I've been witnessing to, and I think our small group would really be a benefit to him or her. Can I invite this person? Or I haven't seen so-and-so for a couple of weeks now. Maybe what I need to do is to give them a call and make sure everything is okay. And being a spiritual young adult is an exciting phase of life. It's great to, to be in that phase because what's beginning to happen is these words of Jesus Christ are beginning to turn into actions in our lives. And you really get to see how all of this stuff that we've been talking about really does make a difference and it finally begins to make sense to us. So hopefully, if you are in that stage of your spiritual walk, you are beginning to feel a sense of moving out of being a disciple, and you start to look at other people in the church, and you say, you know what, that's someone that I probably should begin investing my life into, and discipling this person, and meeting with this person, and, and allow us to grow together. Now, this is Caleb's. He hasn't used it in a little while. But this is the thing that, you know, parents, you understand this, how you get that call, or you don't get the call necessarily, but you get home after going to the grandparents' house, and it's like 10 o'clock at night, and your child is running around, where's my blanket, where's my blanket, oh, we left it at so-and-so's house, and you have to go and pick it up and everything else. This thing, for my children at least, was a huge deal. So there's Caleb, there's Eden's. And there's Eli's. Eli's, he's sick at home right now, so we don't want to handle this one too much. Um, because he's been holding it all night. You know, if there is one thing that reminds me of being a parent to my children, it's these things because of the ridiculous things we've had to do to find them. And they've been lost and everything else. But being a parent means that we are intentional about a number of things. We intentionally put off things or we, we, we put things down the road in order to spend time with our children. We think of them before we think of ourselves. We, we are intentional in not assuming that our children are just going to become godly men or women. We realize it's going to take a lot of effort on our part, a lot of sacrifice on our part, and that is the other characteristic of being a spiritual parent. We sacrifice things in our own lives. A parent is willing to sacrifice much for his or her child. I don't know how many times I've had to sacrifice the last story. You know, I've been eyeing it up, and I come home and I'm like, oh sweet, it's going to be time for cookies and milk. And I get home and Caleb already took it. <laughs> how many times do we have to sacrifice Oreos or, or our plans? Sleep with a newborn. 
How many times do we have to sacrifice sleep with a teenager where we're worried, you know, wondering, are they okay? What's happening? The list goes on and on. A spiritual parent is someone who is willing to sacrifice things in their life so that they can intentionally seek someone else out and begin this relational discipling with them. They look at their lives and they say, okay, these things are gone because I realize there are things that are much more important than what I want to do. So are you dead? Are you an infant? Are you a child? Are you a young adult? Or are you a parent? And once you know where you are with those, then when you know what you need to do, whether you need to seek someone else out and ask them, will you disciple me? Or you begin seeking someone out to ask them, you know, God has laid you on my heart, and I think we need to begin this discipling relationship. So once you do that, what does it look like? What, when people meet together to disciple one another, how do you do it? And the only thing, the best way, answer to that is to do what Jesus Christ did. Luke 24, 13 through 35. It's a big lot of verses here, but Luke 24, 13 through 35. To set the context, Jesus has been crucified, he's, he's resurrected, and he sees these two people walking on the road, and he confronts them. So starting in verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things, these things that had happened, the things about Jesus Christ's crucifixion. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, well, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he had even that they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. And, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. But when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. They, then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were walking about, talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. So did you catch what Jesus Christ did for these disciples, how he discipled them? We tend to overcomplicate things when we talk about discipleship. We like to think that, you know, we have to follow this rigid formula of, okay, if you do A plus B plus C, then that will equal D, which is you've been discipled. And it's this over, 
overcomplicating of what is a very simple thing to do. He spoke with them. He spent time with them. As I asked last week, and we're going to be asking a lot throughout uh, the rest of this year, how is your withness? How are you doing with being with people? Are you looking for ways to not be with them where you can just be by yourself? Or are you really seeking people out to be with them? I can explain discipleship very easily from this passage. Jesus spoke to these two men and taught them from Scripture. And then these two went and spoke to other people about what they had just experienced. That is discipleship. You see, a few things have happened here. They, they were able to take the things that were shared with them. They connected with each other. Jesus connected with these two on the road. He explained things to them. He ministered to them. And then they, in turn, ministered to others. By being with these people and then them being with other people, they were able to talk about God, and that is discipleship. Being intentional, whether it is being a part of a small group, meeting with one other person or two other people, and talking about what is happening. So what, what do I do when I disciple someone? I find someone. I start praying, God, who is somebody that we can I can begin this relationship with? Who are people within this church? Who are people outside of the church that can be discipled. And then I agree on a reading plan with them. We don't go out and buy a book or anything like that. <clears throat> what I do is ask them, find a reading plan and stick to it. And I'm going to hold you accountable to it. And I will read these things with you. I may not be on the same reading plan, but I'm reading the scripture with you. And then we get together and we talk about it. What were some of the things that you read? What, what things spoke to you? What's difficult in the, these verses? How do you apply these things to your life? We are humble and we are honest with each other. If we're struggling in some way, we're accountable to one another. In other words, what we do is we just simply sit down and talk about God. So pray, where is it that I find myself on this spectrum? Am I dead? Am I an infant? Am I a child, a young adult, or a parent? And then seek someone out, whether it is to ask them to be a disciple or to be discipled by you. Be a part of our small group that's starting up this week. We have our group starting. Uh, you still have the opportunity to sign up for it. This is going to be an opportunity where we can just come and gather together and talk a little more about the sermon. You don't have to buy a book. You don't have to do all kinds of reading or anything like that. Just pretend you're paying attention here on Sunday morning. That's it. Because then by the time we have six or seven or eight people talking about it, you can fake your way through it. It's a very easy thing to do. But come and be a part of it. Be a part of the small group. Be a part of some kind of discipleship opportunity. Start meeting together and take these things seriously. Let the Holy Spirit talk to you and lead you to that person. And I trust that it is going to be a wonderful blessing. And I cannot wait when we can stand here as a church and talk about all the different things that God has done through these small groups, through these discipling relationships. Will you please pray with me? There are many in here that maybe uh, are in that infancy stage of, of their faith walk with you. They've just come to know you. And they... They just do not know any better. It's not because they're bad people or anything like that. They just simply do not have the experience, the knowledge to know what to do. We pray that you would surround those people with those that would be willing to disciple them. And we pray also for the spiritual child that is at a point where uh, maybe they're, they're thinking that all of this is for them because they do not know any better yet. God, we pray that you would break through that mentality, whether it is the child uh, that's 20 years old, the child that is 10 years old, or a spiritual child that is 70 years old. God, break through those barriers and allow them to be humble and to seek other people out to be discipled. Lord, we also pray for those that are uh, spiritual young adults. They've reached that point in their lives where they are now beginning to think of things outside of themselves. 
we pray that you would help them along in that journey. We thank you for the excitement that is found in all of these different stages, but especially in the young adult where things finally start to make sense. And we pray for those that are not there yet that you would help them to continue to remain committed, to know that at some point they will, they will begin thinking outside of themselves and then they will understand the grace and the blessing that it is to be your child. And Lord, we do pray for the spiritual parents that you would enable them to find others, to, to disciple them, to invest their lives into them, to, uh, to multiply so that we can go and do that which you have called us to do, to make disciples. And God, we pray that you would remind us of how simple it is to do this, that you would allow each and every one of us to really take it seriously, to open our Bibles, to read from it, to pray through it, but then also to meet with other people and talk about it. God, you did not save us so that we can be by ourselves in our faith. And whether our spouses support us or not, God, we know that you have saved us into a community of believers. So Lord, allow us to find that community, to find that fellowship, and to be discipled or to disciple others to your glory. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Visit us on the web at www.rollinghillschurch.today or drop in for a visit at 120 Garner Drive, Verona, PA, 15147. Service time is 10 a.m. on Sunday. Send us a message via email to rollinghillsbaptist at comcast.net or reach us by phone at 412-795-1133.